um, as well after the meeting. So I'll, I'll send some links out uh, with that. So I will go ahead and uh, start uh, sharing my desktop. This is, I'm gonna do, kind of go through uh, lots of tutorial um, information today and definitely um, open to questions that uh, people have along the way. So feel free uh, folks to, to chime in and um, ask questions as we're going. Um, if folks notice a question in the chat that I miss, uh, uh, also feel free to um, stop me as I'm going. Um, so this really, like, I'm, I'm glad uh, Pascal's here because uh, I, I was starting to play with Docker a while back. Pascal had done some work with it. He gave me an overview of what he had learned. And then I took that, did, did a little bit more work and kind of um, through this, there, there's kind of uh, what we'll go over today has been sort of a, a couple months of learning and experimenting. And I think we've come up with something that's going to be uh, a pretty useful development support tool for folks working with DSpace. Um, uh, so um, here is a tutorial page. This is a, a, a repo from GitHub. Um, so if, if you happen to play with this after the meeting, this uh, repository, DSpace Labs, DSpace Docker Images is available and open for uh, pull requests. So feel free to um, go ahead and um, suggest some changes as you go through uh, uh, this material. But my goal here is really to um, make it easy for folks um, from their own desktop to really configure just about any conceivable DSpace test environment that you could imagine. Maybe it would be difficult with Docker to test a really, really large instance, but um, the various combinations of software uh, versions and database versions, hopefully we've, we've made it um, easy for folks to get in and to do some, uh, to configure an environment for testing. So just, I'll do like a, a quick, um, explanation of what Docker is and then kind of illustrate that using DSpace as an example. Um, so uh, Docker simplifies installation requirements for hosting an application by running what's what's called an image or a Docker image within a containerized environment or a Docker container. And Docker, the company, offers uh, a registry of Docker images that are available for use. And uh, <laughs> I've got a, a slow uh, link right now, um, getting this uh, to open. So we'll uh, wait a second for this. Try going to it directly. All right, so um, in here you'll see there's a registry of um, Docker images. I'm logged in as myself. So I've got my own like personal Docker images that I've published, but also I'm an administrator of our DSpace Docker image registry. So we have a number of images that can be referenced and used. These are supported by the project to make it easy to do um, testing within Docker. So we have um, sort of a, a customized version of Postgres to make it easy to run a database test. And then we have um, an image of the DSpace software itself to make that um, easier to uh, run and test. And one of the things that we've done um, sorry, is, can I, sorry for the interruption. Could you please? copy the link um, of this site that's actually open to Slack. That would be great. Um, sure. I'm not sure how if everyone's uh, using Slack right now, but um, I'll put that in the dev channel. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. Um, so one of the things that we have um, done with our um, DSpace images, if we come to the DSpace, uh, DSpace image, you'll actually see that um, there are a number of different tags, or these are versions of our DSpace image. So 
we have a version of the master branch of DSpace. This was most recently updated five days ago. We have a version of the DSpace 5X branch, 6X branch, and 4X branch. So these are our three supported versions um, in production. We also have the master branch where all of the DSpace 7 development is going on. Plus we have built static images of the most three recent releases of DSpace, so 4.9, 5.9, and 6.3. So these are all uh, available and if, when I show you how you make use of a Docker image, all of these are, are readily available for you to use. Another thing that we've done is we have automated the build of the main branches of DSpace. So as the code for the master 5X, 6X, and 4X branches change, we'll actually automatically rebuild the Docker images to include the latest code. So here, if you go to build details, you'll actually see a history of uh, what has been built and how recently it's been updated. So if, if we were to merge a, a whole bunch of changes on a given day, we'll end up with a bunch of these builds queuing up one after the other, but eventually they'll catch up and become available uh, for folks to use. I would say it takes about 45 minutes to an hour for um, uh, an individual Docker build to run. Pop back to our tutorial page. So the other um, thing that Docker provides is uh, something called a Docker Compose file. And so a Docker Compose file lets you um, orchestrate the starting and stopping of um, multiple interrelated containers. So if you're running DSpace 4, 5, or 6, we want to run both a Tomcat instance for the DSpace code and a database in instance most likely Postgres, but we also just recently added some instructions for how to um, connect to an Oracle database um, if that's something that you need to test. For DSpace 7, uh, we actually have three components that are orchestrated by a Docker Compose file. And those, um, we, you've got the database, you have the Tomcat instance, and then the Angular user interface. So pretty much uh, most of the things I'm going to do um, as we step through this tutorial. I'm going to, I'm going to show you some very simple Docker commands, but then the bulk of this tutorial is really going to be done using Docker Compose, which I think is going to be our, our recommended approach. So I think uh, we'll find that if you need to do something directly with Docker on the command line, that's available to you, but things are probably easier if you control everything through a Compose file. And when we take a look at some of these, you'll see all the things that are bundled in there to make things convenient. So just a quick summary to, to give a bit of um, motivation for why we decided to publish DSpace um, out to Docker Hub. We wanted to enable users, and then in my mind, ideally repository managers as well, to easily test the latest code from each of our supported branches of DSpace. So uh, the, big, the trickiest thing is, um, can you get uh, Docker running on your desktop? Docker is supported on Mac OS and it's supported on Windows 10, uh, but only Windows 10. So if you have an older version of Windows, it's maybe something you have to wait until your, your institution eventually upgrades the, the version of Windows in order to get it uh, running. Um, so we also uh, want to make it easy for users to test um, the code at uh, published releases of DSpace. So you could either test what's current on the main branches and what was published at each individual uh, DSpace release. Um, we want to uh, simplify the installation requirements for developers wishing to contribute to the platform. So, you know, one of the things that may be useful if, if we decide that, that this is a really good and useful approach as we onboard new developers and new project contributors, you know, we may recommend Docker as kind of the starting point for folks, as opposed to those of us who are sort of adding it into our workflow later in the process. Um, it'll make it very easy to manage um, multiple versions of DSpace. So in particular, um, you know, let's say you, you make a contribution to DSpace 6 and then 
folks say, well, you know what, that, that change looks good. We should actually provide that to DSpace 5 and to DSpace 7. Regardless of you know, the, your own internal uh, development and test environment, using some of these Docker features, you'd have the ability to test uh, with a version of DSpace that's different from what's running in your main test environments. Um, so, and then just in general, simplify the number of dependencies you have on your desktop when you want to test DSpace. So rather than installing a database yourself or all of the necessary components for Angular, uh, just Docker becomes sort of your, your single uh, desktop dependency that you have. Um, the images that we're going to go over today, really, um, they, they've only been used for development purposes. And really, even, even at that, we're, we're kind of in the early stages of testing. So I would say these images are really intended only for development use, not for production. But uh, be interesting to see in, you know, as we make greater and greater use of this, if we ever find these images would become an attractive solution for, uh, for production purposes. So the first thing I want to do is uh, go through the process of setting up Docker. So we'll see, I've got a series of tutorials here, and I figure based on um, how time goes and how questions go, we'll kind of work our way through um, several of these. Uh, but if we don't happen to get through them all in the course of the call today, they'll be there um, uh, available for you to use. I think, I think I've got them sequenced in a way that uh, will make um, some good sense. So uh, first thing uh, we need to do is set up Docker on our desktop. For a few of these tutorials, I actually have uh, YouTube videos of me stepping through these uh, just to, to make things um, easier. Uh, so you uh, need to install Docker on your desktop. And then you need uh, a command line tool to um, issue Docker commands. So if you're running Docker on, I. I'm not actually sure what if you run Linux as a desktop, what the support is for Docker. But if you're running Mac OS, um, I recommend you use a bash shell. And then for Windows 10, my recommendation is to use the git bash shell. And the reason for that is that the command syntax most closely resembles the syntax that you'd use on Mac OS or on Linux. Uh, so it's uh, fairly convenient. You can, you can also use a, Windows uh, command shell or PowerShell, but these instructions um, in this tutorial really just focus on uh, the git bash shell. And if you happen not to run git bash, um, let me show you where I found it. I'm going to, I run um, GitHub for Windows, and I think in my options, um, I set my default shell to git bash. Um, so typically what I will do is um, open up GitHub for Windows and then there's a keyboard shortcut uh, control um, apostrophe that will open up a new shell window. And then when that new shell window opens up, that's running git bash. So for purposes of what I'll be doing today from my Windows computer, I'll do things in a git bash syntax. And I'll, I'll note there's every so often we have to slightly vary the command syntax to work properly on Windows. And I've made note of that in the tutorials. So we are going to, um, first thing we're going to do is run a Docker image using Docker. And as we run it, we're going to pass the dash dash rm option uh, in our command. And what that does is it says, run this image. When the process stops, delete. Um, don't keep a copy of the image around. So by default, uh, Docker will retain your, ima your stopped images, and you have to destroy them manually. But with the dash dash rm command, it cleans things up. So what I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is a very simple command, may not make a whole may not seem terribly exciting, but we'll build upon this. Let me um, I'm going to first just see if I have anything still running. Okay, so I started I in preparation for this meeting, I ran something, so let me stop that. 
we'll take a closer look at this in a minute. So I'm going to run uh, Docker PS dash A. So list, I'm listing any processes I have running in Docker and I currently have none running. The first thing I want to do is I'm going to run Docker run dash SRM to clean up commands. I'm going to run an Ubuntu image. So uh, a simple um, image of Linux. And I'm just going to list the contents of the root directory of this Linux image. And uh, here's the, the first point where we run into uh, a Windows versus Mac OS difference. On Windows, when you reference the, the root directory of an image, you have to double slash the first slash. So let me redo that command. And so here you'll see we're um, taking a look at the root image of this machine. And you'll see, so we have like a temp directory, a var directory, a user directory. Um, so what we did is we started in an Ubuntu image and then issued a command within that image. So the next thing uh, we can do is rather than running just a, a command like ls, we actually could launch a bash shell within our Linux um, image. And because I'm running from Windows um, and need terminal output, I have to prefix the command with winpty. And what I'm going to do is run uh, slash bin slash bash within this image. So here now you'll see my command line has prompt had prompt has changed. I'm the root user um, at some host name, and so from here I can do things like pwd. You'll see I'm at the root directory. I can list the contents of the root directory. I could list the contents of slash temp. Um, so this is a, a very quick and simple way to get an image up and running. Now, what we're going to do in future steps is rather than just running a bare Ubuntu image, we're actually going to start running um, images containing our DSpace code. So I'm going to um, stop this running image. And the next thing I want to do is illustrate um, another thing you can do. So we have the ability to um, run the next image I want to work with is a Tomcat image. So we're going to start up a Tomcat container. We're going to name that container my container. And then we're actually going to run a command inside of that running container. So let me show you what that looks like. So what, if you remember when we went to the Docker Hub website, if we had done a search, you would actually find there is an image for Tomcat and there's the image for Ubuntu that we used. And then now since the DSpace project has posted um, DSpace images, you'd find uh, DSpace images up there. But so now what I've done is I've uh, started a Tomcat container and named it my container. So if I do a docker ps-a, um, you'll see I've got, let me uh, widen this to make it easier to uh, see the results. Here you'll see uh, we're running an image named Tomcat. Uh, the default command when you run a uh, Tomcat image is Catalina.sh, and our name is my container. The next thing I want to do is actually run a command inside of this container. So instead of running Docker run, which starts a new container, I'm going to run Docker exec. So I'm going to execute a command within my container, and the command I'm going to execute is the pwd command. So I want to look at the working directory of that running container. So I'm going to copy that command, uh, paste it. And here you'll see the, the working directory for this container is user local Tomcat, which seems pretty sensible since it's a Tomcat um, image that we're running. So uh, the next thing I want to do is um, stop the container that I started. And now if I do a docker ps, 
You'll see that uh, there is an image named Tomcat. Its status is exited, so it has stopped, and its name still is my container. So the last thing we can do is uh, just clean it. We don't need that container anymore, so we're going to remove the container. So I'll say docker rm my container. If we do the docker ps-a, you'll now see that there are no running containers. Um, in the examples that follow, um, I'm going to control a lot of the different behaviors of Docker using environment variables. Um, <clears throat> so in uh, Mac OS or in a bash shell, the syntax for setting an environment variable is export variable name equals and then the value. Um, slightly different syntax for uh, Windows command shell. And then I actually was unable to figure out how to set a an environment variable in PowerShell. So that was um, when I stopped attempting to use Windows PowerShell. Um, if somebody comes along and figures this out, it would be great to update the tutorial just to, um, to add those instructions in. But now we're actually going to uh, take this, um, take what we've done so far with the tutorial and actually run a real um, DSpace image. This would be a great time if folks have any quick questions about Docker in general. Be glad to answer those. All right, well, I'm going to move on then to uh, running DSpace with Docker Compose. So again, this, this tutorial um, has a little YouTube video uh, for it. So we've already met the uh, prerequisites. We've set up Docker for DSpace. Um, what I want to do now is um, set my environment variable dspace ver to the name of the, um, the, the tagged version of the dspace image that we want to use. So you remember we had the master image, the, the 4x, 5x, and 6x branches, and then the three most recent releases. For this example, I want to use dspace 6x. So I'm going to um, copy that environment variable here. The next thing I want to do is set an inver a variable indicating my um, project that I want to work with. So I'm working with the dspace6 code. I'm actually going to um, set this variable. I'm not going to set it to d6. I'm going to set it to d6a um, because I already have an existing d6, which I'll, I'll show you in a bit. Um, and then we're going to take use uh, Docker Compose to start up our DSpace instance. The first thing that I wanted to show you, though, is what that Docker Compose file looks like. And let me um, increase the text here a little bit. So here is um, our generic DSpace Docker Compose. And this has um, two services that it will start. It will start a service called DSpace DB, and that is going to be built from the image dspace, dspace, postgres, pg crypto. So this is essentially um, a published version of postgres, but with the pg crypto functions enabled in the database. Um, it will also, uh, our image sets a default username and password to dspace and the default uh, database schema name to dspace. Um, there is a, a, we'll talk about volumes in a minute, but we're, we're setting up a volume for storing the Postgres database content. The next thing we're setting up is a second service called dspace. That um, is built from an image, dspace, dspace. So the, the provider or the sort of the owner of the repository is dspace and the name of the image is dspace. So dspace slash dspace is how we reference our image, and then we're referencing a particular tag. So in this compose file, it's set up to default to uh, dspace 6x. Otherwise, it will use that um, environment variable that we set. It's going to set the installation directory for dspace to slash dspace. So that's what our dspace install directory will be. It will expose port 8080 as port 8080 on the local machine. So the within the container, port 8080 will 
be mapped to localhost 8080. So that's how we'll reference it um, within our browser. Um, we've created a, sep a volume for the asset store and a volume for the solar data that get generated by DSpace. And then I have a comment here. Um, if you wish to run a, uh, Mirage, a Mirage 2 theme rather than a regular Mirage theme in XML UI, you can uncomment these lines and it will um, sort of activate a Mirage 2 theme. Um, both of these images that we're creating are running on sort of a, um, a network within Docker called DSpaceNet. Um, our DSpace image depends on the DSpace database. And then there are three volumes that are going to be preserved um, after the image um, has started. So PG data, so the Postgres database data, the asset store, so where all the bit streams get stored, and then any uh, solar content that's generated that will be created within a volume called uh, solar. So that's just a quick overview. Um, and, and really most of these tutorials that um, I've created are tutorials based around some variant of this Docker Compose file that I just showed you, just with uh, some additional um, complications or features um, enabled inside of them. So the syntax for starting a Docker Compose file is uh, Docker Compose up, so up starts it. The up-d starts it and detaches the um, terminal output from the window where you started it. Um, and then this dash p d prod, you remember I set that to d6a, this groups all of the resources that are generated um, in with a single sort of prefix. So let me show you what the output looks like when I run this command. All right, so what happens here is the first thing it says is it created a network, d6a dspace net, so all of these images that are started sort of run within their own virtual network. It created three volumes, each prefixed with that D6A. So we have a volume for the um, <clears throat> Postgres data, the asset store, and solar. And I'll show you eventually the, the significance of these volumes. It's actually a really powerful feature. We've created an image. Uh, D6A, DSpace, DB, and we've created an image D6A, DSpace. So now if I run uh, docker ps-a, you will see that we have um, two containers in an up status. You can see the image that they were built from. So there's our DSpace image, and he happens to be named uh, D6A, DSpace1. And you'll see our database image, and the container name is d6a d space db. So now, what I'm going to do is um, open my browser. I'm on localhost 8080, and I'm going to connect to the XML UI service within this container. So right now, you'll see um, some evidence of a prior run of mine. Uh, it's still loading right now. So much as it takes a while for um, Tomcat and DSpace to start up on a, on a real server, they also take a bit of time to start up um, within a Docker container. So as we're waiting on this, if folks have any questions, feel free to jump in with those. So we had, I had shown you, you know, that ability to do a Docker exec command. So you can uh, connect to one of these running images, get into the image, look at log files, um, run dspace commands within the images themselves. So a number of uh, different things you can do once you have the images up and running. But here you'll see I have a bare dspace instance with no content up and running. You asked for questions, maybe one short thing. 
um, Terry, you described how we could, can influence the whole build process and the running process with um, environment variables. Mm -hmm. Is there any, anywhere an overview of all available variables that matters? Sure, each, each of these tutorials that um, I was stepping through describe the variables that you need to set right at the top in this prerequisite section. That's already helpful, but out of a Docker file or a Docker Compose file, there's nothing that's telling me which uh, variables are useful, right? So I just have to look into the documentation. Right. Uh, because it's it's only the compose files that are using the the environment variables. The Docker images themselves aren't using the environment variables. Thank you. Sure. All right. So here we have our our running uh, version of DSpace. Not terribly exciting yet, but we'll do a bit more with it. Um, so the next thing I want to show you. So we we took a look at the running processes. Um, we also have the ability to list all of the volumes containing that D6A as a prefix. And I just want to show you what that looks like from the command line. So what I'm looking at is I'm saying Docker list all my volumes and then filter those for a label containing a project of D6A. So here you'll see asset store, PG data, solar. Um, now what I'd like to do is verify that we're running the version of DSpace that we think we're running. So I am going to, um, essentially what I want to do is say, um, execute um, a command within my DSpace container and run slash DSpace, because you remember that's our install directory, run DSpace bin DSpace version. And because we're running this, I'm running this from Windows, I'm going to prefix this with WinPTY because I need terminal output. And I'm just going to prefix slash dspace as double slash dspace here. So I'm going to run this command. So the cool thing is here, those uh, dspace command line tasks that we, uh, we know and love, we're able to uh, run those within our Shell. So we're running a 6.4 snapshot, which makes sense since we built that off the 6x branch. Um, we are, the Tomcat image we're running is using this JRE. So we've got that JRE. It's confirming the running web apps running within the application. And um, Yeah, so that's that's the information we can we can glean uh, from the image here. Next, I want to verify that the database schema contains what I expect it to contain. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a command within the database image, and we're going to run some SQL. So we're running uh, PS, the PSQL command within the database image we're passing a user of dspace. And the command we're running is essentially selecting from the schema version table to grab the last installed rank row from the table. And that'll roughly correlate to the dspace version that we're running. So let me take that command, paste it. And so here you'll see within this database, uh, we have, um, 6.1.2017.0103. So that was the last um, schema update that had been applied to our database. So now we've confirmed that we're running a 6x version of DSpace with a 6x schema within the database. It's also possible to, uh, just as we did with that um, Ubuntu image or the Tomcat image we worked with, we can access the command line directly. So I'm going to um, run docker exec. We're passing the IT, which indicates we want terminal output. Um, we, we're overriding the, the key that's used to stop our interactive session with control P. This way you don't accidentally send a control C to your running service. We're going to um, 
connect to the DSpace container and we're going to run a bash shell within it. So let me do that. All right, so now you'll see I'm the root user within this container. I'm at directory user local Tomcat. And what I want to do is run DSpace bin DSpace version. So the same thing we ran before. Um, but I'm going to run that within the um, container itself. And we'll get the same in information that we got uh, before when we ran it externally. So here's our information about the server. Now I'll hit the control P, which we said is the escape character, and then back out to my uh, Windows shell. Um, in, a, in a similar manner, we could um, connect to the database image and start a, an interactive PSQL session. And let's run a simple query, um, select uh, count star from item. And we have no items in the repository yet. Uh, so now what I can do is um, stop my running container. So I'm going to run uh, Docker Compose, pass the same project identifier that we passed before, and issue uh, the stop command. Oops, I'm going to exit my PSQL session. I'll paste that stop command in. It's now indicating that it's stopping our two images. So now those are stopped. If I do a docker ps-a, you'll now see that we have two image uh, containers that are in a stop status. So I could start them back up by saying um, uh, docker compose-p uh, and then start. Uh, but we also can completely destroy those images with the down command. So let me do that. So here now our um, containers have been destroyed as well as that virtual network that was created. So I'm gonna do a Docker PS-A. Now you'll see no, no running images, but the interesting thing is our volumes persisted. So if I run this command to look for our volumes, our asset store, our PG data, and our solar are still around. Were I to restart DSpace, uh, which I'll go ahead and do, this time it's create, recreating the network, it's recreating the containers, but it doesn't need to recreate the volumes. And where this becomes really handy is you can, um, create some Docker containers, load a bunch of test data, that test data will be preserved to a set of volumes. Then you can completely destroy those containers, update the DSpace software, recreate uh, the containers, possibly with new software, but reuse the contents of the existing volumes. So this is a way for your test data or your test assets to persist um, in spite of the version of um, the software that you're running. So part of my rationale for using this dash p dproj variable is I'm imagining that for myself, I might want to have a 4x, a 5x, a 6x, and a 7x version of DSpace. And I want to keep, I want to reuse the volumes. Anytime I run DSpace 7, I want to reuse that same content but I don't want it to intermix when I'm running DSpace 5. So it becomes a nice way to segment different um, test environments and different uh, sets of test data. So the next thing that I want to show you is um, the, oh, and here would be our command to go ahead and destroy those volumes were we to want to destroy those volumes, which, which I actually uh, don't care to do at this point. But the next thing I want to do is show you how to ingest content into um, containers. But 
uh, want to take a pause if uh, folks have any questions at this point. I'll also note that folks can type into the chat as, as you're going, Terry, because I'm kind of keeping an eye on that if questions come up along the way. Super. Thanks for This is really cool. Cool. Good. Good. Glad to hear it. Yeah, this is, I, the more I got into this, the, the more excited I got at the possibilities here. So uh, next one is um, ingesting content into DSpace with Docker Compose. And um, what I want to do is I'm going to show you the, um, Compose file I've created, and then we'll come back and set these variables uh, accordingly. So here I have um, a specialized version of the Compose file, uh, particularly for purposes of um, ingesting content. So the, the main variation from the Compose files that we saw before is I'm mounting a volume called ingest tools, and this is based on an environment variable into a directory called ingest tools within our database image. And I'm also mounting that same directory into our DSpace um, uh, image. And our DSpace image, we're mounting, we're using an environment variable AIP dir to mount a directory of um, AIP files to facilitate ingest into our images. Otherwise, this compose file is the same as the compose file that we worked with before. And I want to show you um, the content of those uh, tools. So I'm going to go to this add-ons directory, um, mount ingest tools. And here we have um, a script that will create an admin user. Um, and all it's doing is creating an, ad, an administrator, test it, test edu, and setting the password to admin. Um, and I've got an ingest AIP script that iterates, it looks for a directory called AIP dir, and then it iterates over uh, the directory looking for any AIP files that it finds. And then it um, uses the DSpace packager command to ingest that content um, into the repository using that test at test.edu um, administrator name that we just set up. So I am going to return back to our tutorial. We are running the ingesting content tutorial. So we need to set a dspace ver variable. We've already, we're already running dspace six, so I don't need to reset this variable. Our dproj is set to d6a. We need to set um, an AIP directory. So I have an existing um, directory of AIP files, um, and it's, it's in a, uh, published project that you can you can find it's linked on the on the tutorial page but it's essentially a bunch of pictures of my dog um, so content that would I felt uh, comfortable making freely available so I'm setting AIP directory to my local clone of this repository with a bunch of test data in it so I'm going to set that variable and then um, this ingest tools um, variable, it's already set to uh, this default. Um, so this, this is referencing those ingest scripts that I showed you within the Docker images repo, but I'll go ahead and set that variable. The next thing I need to do is change my working directory from dspace compose to dspace ingest compose. And so now what I will do is I'm going to um, restart my Docker Compose file. When it restarts, we're going to find that um, the, this additional content I've mounted will be available in the image. So 
So we're recreating our image. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run Docker exec running within our DSpace image. And I'm going to run one of those scripts that I mounted. So I mounted it to slash to slash ingest tools. We've got <coughs> create admin.sh. So let me run that command. Right, so now we have an administrator within our repository. Next, I'm gonna run that create ingest um, command. As this may take a moment, Terry, um, I just note that Chris asked a question on um, the chat here. Okay. Um, around just a general question around have, if, whether anybody has any concerns about getting um, out of Docker in the future, especially getting data out of Docker since Docker is still, um, I guess, basically more new in terms of technologies. So one of the one of the challenges that I I've faced, and I'm not sure if um, this is due to my lack of knowledge of Docker or if it's something peculiar to Docker itself, is I what I would really like to be able to do is. Um, as I create these volumes, I wish I could clone the volumes and then sort of version them and reuse them. I've not seen a command uh, for that purpose. With Docker though, you can, any volume that you access in Docker, you can mount it as a local file system volume rather than a Docker volume. And then it's explorable uh, from your file system. Um, the catch is it's my understanding if you mount a local directory versus a, a volume that's purely managed by Docker, um, it's it's per, it's less performant uh, when it needs to manipulate things using the local file system. But so right now we're storing like the DSpace install directory in this volume that we call DSpace, but we could instead say mount uh, C colon slash DSpace to DSpace within our image. And then anything I would do within my running image would actually be visible as a directory on my uh, Windows desktop. Um, so I, I think it's got some capabilities to expose content. I'm not sure if I, I answered your question or not. Uh, feel free to. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Terry, I'll, I'll chime in. Um, but uh, this is Chris, by the way. Um, I'm kind of with you. That seems to be my understanding of Docker and how volumes work is uh, if you have, uh, I guess, a file mount volume, you can explore that data. It's more easily portable, uh, but you do get more performance uh, across uh, different multiple containers, especially if you're sharing data within a DSpace or sorry, a, a Docker volume itself. Um, uh, I might be wrong on that, but that, that's my understanding so far. Uh, my only issue uh, that I've been concerned with is if I'm using an actual Docker volume and later down the road, for some reason, Docker is not working out or we need to move uh, particularly the web assets information. Um, if we're using a Docker volume, um, is there an easy way to get that out without, I don't know, connecting it to a, a temporary container and then putting it under version control and pulling it out with Git or something like that. Terry, may I jump in here? Sure. So Pascal again, um, I think if you, if you're really running a system in production, I would always um, have any backup plans. And one of a uh, serious backup plan would be to um, run the DSpace asset store in a, uh, bind mount, so that's what, what Terry explained uh, directly mm -hmm. that is mounted on your host system and in your Docker container. So you have always access from the host system to, to all the PDFs that, that, that you loaded up into DSpace. And maybe you also um, uh, have a cron job that is writing a database dump um, to, to such a bind volume. 
So then you can have um, can 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 run on your on your host system a backup system that is that is storing all these data, so the database dump and the asset store files to to your backup, so you have them secured, for example. Um, to come back to your question, if you can access the volume directly that was not previously mounted on your host system and your container. Um, I looked into this for macOS and um, there is a description and it is possible, but to me, honestly, it looked painful because it depends on which Docker version you're using. Um, they're using different volume formats depending on, on the Docker version. So on some Docker version, you have a QCOW, on, on, on others, you have a, a some kind of raw image. And then there are tools that you can use to change this into another format, for example, to, to mount it in your uh, virtual box or VMware or whatever you, you're using. So yes, it is possible to, to, exact the, uh, to, to access the, the volume directly, but it, it is not easy and it's not the way probably you would like to, to go and you would like to use for recovery and it's much better to have a backup plan for production, production systems um, from the beginning. There is also a Docker CP command that lets you um, copy between your host file system and the container file system. And it looks like you can go either way with it. Um, initially, for, for this ingest example that I was showing, I was, I was recommending running a Docker CP rather than mounting the directory. And then it just seemed like it was, it, it was easier to sort of express all the variants in the compose file rather than instructing folks to use this command syntax. But this also might help. OK. All right, so um, perfect timing on the question, because that actually allowed all, <laughs> all of our content to load. Um, there's one quirk of working with AIP files in DSpace, and that's that um, you have to update the sequence ID table after you do an ingest of content. So the other command I'm going to run is in the database um, image, I'm going to run update sequences.sql, which I've also provided in the ingest tools directory. So let me run that command real quick. And that just indicates that if we add any more content beyond what's in our AIP files, um, all the um, unique ID sequencing will behave properly. Okay, so now our content is configured. Let's go look at our running instance of DSpace. All right, so now you'll see we actually have um, a couple of communities. Um, we have uh, <coughs> here we have a picture of my dog in a pumpkin costume. Uh, so we have uh, just the ability now to. Um, navigate and view some uh, content in the repository. So that's the, the process of ingesting content. Now the cool thing is, remember how I explained the way our volumes work. We use this DSpace ingest compose to ingest content into the repository. We could shut down our um, DSpace images, go back to that original directory that we were working with, that didn't have the mounted AIP files or script files reconstitute our containers and all this content would still be present because it's been retained in the volumes. So that's where the power of these preserved volumes uh, becomes really useful when working with uh, Docker Compose. Does that make sense? All right. So the next thing I want to show you is a, a slight variation. So in this example, we were over, we were supplying additional mounts in order to add content to our repository. The next thing I want to do is show you how you can modify code within your Docker container. As, and we're going to use a specialized um, DSpace uh, dev compose file. So let me, um, first I want to, I'm going to go ahead and stop our container. Um, so let me, actually, I'll, I'll use the commands I've provided here. 
So I'm destroying these containers. We'll recreate the containers, but our, our content will be preserved when we recreate them. So I'm going to cd to d space dev compose. And let me show you what that looks like. So in this example, we are going to um, set a variable called dspace source, and that is indicating our source directory from which we're going to deploy code into dspace. Now, in my rec my recommendations are that you run the Maven task locally on your desktop, because I found Maven is painfully slow when I try to run it within Docker. But then you run the ant task to deploy into your container. Um, so I have a preset dspace source directory here. So I'm pointing to, um, actually, that's the wrong directory. I think my directory is dspace6. I just want to make sure I, I have a valid directory. Okay, so here I've got a um, dspace source directory pointed to um, my repo um, locally containing the dspace6 code. I have also um, sort of pre created a set of um, sample code modification here. So let me show you what that looks like. So I have made uh, one modification in this code base. I've changed the text dspace repository that shows up on the home page to say uh, test dspace repository surrounded by double asterisks. So we're going to update our dspace image with this particular bit of code change and then view it locally. All right, so we've set our environment variables. We pointed to the source directory where we've built dspace. Um, so now what I'm going to do is uh, start up dspace. And let's go uh, reload the site. Give this a second to reload. In the meantime, while that's running, I want to show you all what the um, dspace uh, Docker file looks like. So now the dspace Docker file, it exists on the dspace uh, GitHub repo. And our dspace um, images are, we first um, take code and, and run a Maven build of the dspace repo and uh, build that in a directory called slash app. We run Maven package on it. Then we um, actually explicitly, we, we then build an image from Tomcat 8, and we install ant into that image. And then from our Tomcat 8 image, we end up running our um, ant update command. And once that has been run, 
We then um, create symlinks in slash D space over to the Tomcat directory so that all the web apps are served up from the D space install directory. So this is what's going on in the Docker file. It's relatively um, simple. I don't want to spend too long going over this, but we're going to leverage the fact that our final DSpace image is a version of Tomcat that has Ant installed within it. That's what will allow us to deploy new code into our image. So you may remember I, um, I have restarted our containers. We've not modified any code yet. Um, the content from our volumes were preserved. So, so all the, the photos of my dog are still present within these containers. And the next thing I want to do is deploy that code modification that I showed you. And so what we're going to do is um, we're going to um, use our mounted source directory and go to the DSpace installer directory. That's going to be our working directory. From that working directory, um, inside of our DSpace image, there's our DSpace image, we're going to run ant update clean backups. And so that will deploy the code to the DSpace install directory of our container. So the output of this will look uh, familiar to folks who have deployed DSpace. It's a good time if folks have any questions to um, throw them out. I'll throw one out there. Um, I was going to put it in the chat, but while we're waiting, um, uh, when do you guys uh, expect that maybe DSpace would be, or sorry, Docker would be a viable uh, means of production DSpace deployment? Do y'all have a timeline for that? Or is that just a matter of comfort level or are there specific things that you guys just haven't figured it out, figured out yet? You know, I, I think it's still pretty new. Like, so this meeting I'm almost seeing is kind of our kickoff meeting just to get other folks trying it out for development purposes. <clears throat> um, so I don't even, I, I don't even know that it's on anyone's awareness to say it's definitively supported for production. So I would, um, I'd say we probably need volunteers to actually sort of test it and prove it. Um, a, an interim step that in, in my dream world that I would like to see is I would love it if we figured out how to deploy Docker containers to something like AWS and be able to build like pull request test environments in the cloud based off of Docker images. So that to me is like a next step I'm interested in to actually say production support for it. That's yeah, I, it's hard for me to even know, you know, when or if that um, would be in the picture. So yeah, Tim, I can jump in here, Terry, as well. Um, I would actually say that I'm doubtful that would ever really come to fruition just because our concentration is not really on I mean, that, that's a hard promise to make. It, it's hard to promise that a, a single production um, Docker instance will work for everybody. Um, namely, in terms of performance, in terms of scalability, um, you're gonna really wanna customize that sort of deployment to your own needs based on how large an inst how much content you have. You might want it to be more scalable. You might need to tweak the settings in Postgres and even in Tomcat to provide more memory. You also may want to apply custom themes and things of that nature, which would require tweaking some of these scripts or loading themes from elsewhere. Um, so there's just so many variables in place when it comes to production that it's really hard to manage that centrally. But I think it, I think there would be a goal of being able to build pretty stable um, Docker images that you could um, extend to build your own production inst um, images um, or build from, uh, but we wouldn't be managing those production quality instances centrally, if that makes sense. Sure, and I, I guess that's kind of what I, I was getting at as a base image. You know, everybody's going to have potentially their own themes and that sort of thing. So just 
in the same way that DSpace right now, uh, it almost works better uh, to like fork your own version if you're getting it from the GitHub repo and um, and then have your own version with your own themes and that and configuration and that kind of thing. Uh, but maybe have like a, a base uh, Docker uh, Compose set up so that uh, we can just uh, edit a few configuration files um, and link that up with be our own uh, branch. I, I don't know. I, I, I see what you're talking about and I agree. Um, I guess I wouldn't expect uh, for uh, anybody to really bank on just being able to say Docker pull D space, D space, Docker up, compose up and be done, you know. Right, <laughs> that's yeah. Not, that's not gonna happen. Um, but, you know, as far as running DSpace and Docker, uh, are there any uh, giant red flags that you guys have seen so far against that? Uh, you know, even if we just kind of did it on our own, you know, we could take the, the regular DSpace uh, GitHub repo that we would normally build DSpace with anyways and just run it in the Docker container instead of um, directly on a on an instance of Linux or something. Yeah, and I'll actually mention, I don't think there are any red flags, and I think potentially you could even, yeah, you could look at what um, Terry is presenting here as, as places to start from. Um, we just don't like to make promises that this is production ready until we feel more confident, obviously, because um, this sure. is all very, very new. Um, I'll also note that th that I am aware that there are actual actually sites out there that run DSpace on Docker. Um, and there's okay. uh, there's service providers who've done this data in the past as well. Um, I am not aware of them actually sharing their images publicly, but I've I've heard mm -hmm. through the grapevine that that folks have done this and done it successfully. So this is kind of the first instance of us trying to come together and share what all we've learned and see if we can build that sort of common um, base image or at least something that people could start to look at and build their own images off of um, and learn from. Um, so we're kind of in the early days, but, but I think there is a lot of promise here. And I, I think you definitely could start to bring this forward and look at implement it in production. And I don't see any reason why that should work perfectly fine. Sure. And uh, it seems like if we, uh, just from a production standpoint, so um, most of the configuration, the um, environment variables and that kind of thing that are uh, being set up here are really targeted for flexibility and development. Uh, but I guess if we were just strictly needing uh, a Docker Compose setup for our specific use case, uh, seems like that configuration would be extremely uh, simplified um, because the process of building and deploying DSpace after you already have uh, your themes and everything in place are relatively simple. You're doing the same roughly five steps over and over again each time you make an edit or a change, correct? Yeah, that's correct. I, I would think that one thing you would want to have in a more production scenario though is to be able to uh, redeploy with like say more memory um, sure. or, um, or uh, tweaking your Postgres options if you're using a Postgres database for better performance. Mm -hmm. So there's things of the, that nature that in a production sort of scenario, those become a little bit more important because if you start to hit performance issues with your DSpace Docker, because you've suddenly got an influx of, I don't know, um, hundreds of thousands of items and, and you need a little bit more memory to work with, then you'd want to be able to tweak that relatively easily and redeploy. Um, so there's things like that that become more, more important in production and are less important in development and testing um, scenarios because we're not really trying to, to do that yet, at least. Sure. So I, think, and, uh, I think we should have okay. two goals with this. One goal is to make it easy to test and develop these space. I think we're really, really close to this. The other goal is to show out how people can come to a point where they are or can, can give an introduction to people to run DSpace and Docker so they can get on their own to a point to run it in production. And that means, as Tim explained, all the details you have in your setup, that what we, what we touched before, for example, the backup strategy, these are things you really have to solve on your own depending on your, on your, local, your local setup. What we can provide is a way that shows you these are scripts, these are Docker files, these are build files that helps you to run Docker and the small parts, the details, the 
um, embedding in, in, in your framework, these are things you will have to do on your own locally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so does, does that, that make, make more sense, Chris? Yeah. Oh, yes, definitely. I, I guess yeah. uh, it's just uh, I'm trying to get, figure out uh, what uh, y'all feel is for Docker and its use case and potentially what you're working towards. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about seeing uh, what all is going on. So uh, thank you. Yep. Sure. We do have on Slack a DSpace Docker channel, not not terribly active, but I think the folks who are most excited about this are monitoring it. So, you know, like mm -hmm. if, if as as you do your own experimentation and make some progress, definitely share share your findings there and you, know, you never know what you'll inspire in other people. It's kind of like these casual conversations that uh, a handful of us had sort of, you know, led us to get to the point where we've, we've got what we've got today. Gotcha. Yeah, and I'll, yeah, I see that. And I'll also mention, I'm not sure that anyone, I, I'm actually curious if, if anyone on this call right now is running DSpace with Docker in production, because that's another good question. I don't believe anyone is, because we're all still sort of investigating, but I'm is there anybody? I'm not running it in production in the sense of hosting, but I'm running it, my whole development circle is set up on Docker. Okay. And even big parts of my deployment strategies are set up on Docker. Excellent. Yeah, because I guess that's worth noting that a lot of us are still kind of in the, that investigation phase. We see a ton of promise, and it looks like there this this could be a great route for everybody, but we don't have a whole lot of folks doing it in production quite yet. But so it's I'm on the horizon. It on, I'm I'm doing it on a daily basis, but I'm more running 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 developments and really hosting services. So maybe so out of my consideration, I would say I have it in production. Okay. Okay. And would um, and this is really more uh, Docker focused, a uh, Docker focused question more so than deep space. But uh, and you guys' experience with Docker, what uh, what sort of limitations of Docker would we run into first? Would it be space or memory, and is that manageable through Docker, or is that just the ceiling Docker has, and you'd have to figure out how to put things up after you hit uh, hit that limit? It's a good question. I don't know the answer to that right now. Pascal, have you hit any issues with that, I guess, in your um, deployment environments in terms of memory or space limitations? No, I, I didn't run against any issues on my own. I, I do not develop, uh, I do not put this stuff out to clients because they are mostly not developing, but, but just requesting changes. So mm -hmm. they don't have a use case for it. Um, and, uh, um, I haven't heard any complaints. Terry, did you got any complaints in, 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 in Slack Docker channel? No, no, but I would say the one limitation I ran into, so I've got like a third of my hard drive sort of allocated for Docker use. And before we automated the, the builds of the of DSpace to run on Docker Hub, I was free, I was running lots and lots of uh, Docker file builds, like image builds. And on a nearly daily basis, I completely filled that hard drive allocation. So there are some, some actions, and I think I mostly encountered it running Docker build rather than running actual images where it just used lots and lots of resources. And I had to sort of destructively go in and clean things up and, you know, fortunately, with what I'm doing, it was, I could tolerate deleting that stuff and starting from scratch. But so there may be ways in which it becomes a real space hog or memory hog. So it's got kind of a vague answer, but uh, that, that was the main thing I encountered. I think that that's, that's a good direction to point to. So this space might become a problem. That's something you are routinely looking when you're using Docker, I think, at least in my experience. Every so often, maybe once a week, I need to explicitly um, stop and restart the Docker process. Um, I don't know, like potentially that could be, be because Docker pushed updates or it might just be my Docker sort of run, you know, 
service got in a bad state and just needed to be restarted. But then it seemed like once I restarted it, things functioned pretty well. Uh, well, I, one of the limits that I've just seen with Docker in general is the container sizes, uh, the default container size is 10 gigs. But if you're linking uh, your database to run in a volume, uh, does the volume do the volumes have that kind of space constraint? I know we're rabbit trailing here, but <laughs> I'm really trying to figure out how this works. Yeah, I I don't know. I I'm assuming that the volume like space for volumes is more tolerant than than the space for the images. Um, so if you if you've got the image down to a manageable size, then I would expect volume growth just to be whatever normal disk growth would be. Mm -hmm on a server in a VM. Okay. Great. Well, let me um, pop him back to uh, what I was doing. So you all saw I ran the ant deploy. Um, I ran a Docker compose restart because because I changed the code. I wanted to restart Tomcat. And then I refreshed uh, my page. So here you'll see that change that I deployed has now um, taken effect within the repository. So. It is possible to, um, you know, not only use the published images, but actually to use it as a uh, test environment for deploying changes. Little, I mean, it was a little sluggish running that ant update. So, you know, I don't know if there are ways to um, optimize that or if it's more a matter of just the resources I've assigned, but at least it's, it's nice to know it can be a fully functional um, deployment environment. So, I have a handful of other things uh, that I could show you all and maybe, uh, so we've got um, 10 minutes left and uh, glad, I'm glad to go through another example in particular if there are ones that folks are interested in, but I wanted to point out here on the wiki page for our meeting today, um, I added three next steps that I would like to see happen. I'd like um, folks to try out the tutorial and then report back on their progress. Um, if you see any any errors in the tutorial or have improvement ideas, submit a pull request to the uh, tutorial repo. And then if folks have any ideas or great sets of sample content that folks could use, I would love to see us build up like a little repo of useful AIP files that folks could reference rather than people trying to create their own test data. Obviously it would need to be freely distributable content if we're publishing it in AIP files. But anyway, those are some next steps that came to mind. This page will also uh, be updated to contain a video of this session today. Um, so those are the, the key things. Um, but are you all interested in seeing DSpace 7 running within the repository? Would that be a good next example? Is that okay, possible? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we can get it running. So I just want to point out there are, um, there's a way to run DSpace 7, Angular, um, and the REST API with Docker Compose. We also have a Docker Compose file just for running Angular and then it con connecting to an external uh, DSpace REST API. So a couple of interesting things there. Um, I added a new tutorial for um, using Docker. Um, and then some instructions on how to create automated builds for your own pull requests. So if you are submitting pull requests, you could make life easier for testers by actually publishing a Docker image of your pull request. So a couple things just to reference, but let's do the um, Angular plus REST um, Docker example. So what I want to do is I'm going to stop my running instance. I'm going to go to the uh, DSpace um, 7 compose directory. And in this case, what I want to do is I want to run um, the master DSpace code. And I want to set my project to D7. And I'm going to use some existing volumes I have. So this will reference some content I've already loaded, so we won't need to go through the content ingest process. And now I'll run Docker Compose up.
So here you'll see we are having a D7, D space DB, D space 7, D space. So that's the REST API. And then D space, D space Angular starting. Um, so we'll give, give this stuff a moment to start up. And um, I've got some links here that'll be useful. So let's uh, make sure that the REST APIs come up and then we'll check, look for the Angular user interface. <coughs> As we're waiting on that, um, do Docker PS dash A. Oh, and I guess I had stopped rather than destroying my D D6A images, but those are fine. They're not in a running state. But here you can see our three running instances. Uh, so we're just needing to go through the, the startup sequence here. So in the meantime, while we're waiting for this to run, I'll also make a pitch. If folks have any ideas for future developer show and tell meetings, we'll be glad to schedule those. Um, we don't have any pending agenda items, so I'm going to kind of wait until we have another topic. And once we have a topic, we'll, we'll set up another uh, set of meetings. So um, reach out if you've got ideas of things that would be, you think would be of interest to a, a group of DSpace developers. So I'm aware we're we're going to hit pretty close to time. So certainly I'll I'll understand if folks need to sign off. But I I expect before <laughs> in the next four minutes we'll get these uh, components um, to start up. And for, for those of you who are new, definitely uh, you know jump on Slack and get engaged with um, the community. I think folk, folks are always excited to uh, to see new faces and meet new developers, and I think you'll find um, folks are are uh, pretty eager to answer questions and help people out. I was just thinking to to say exactly this. And if you're going to 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 Slack, please give us feedback in DSpace Docker to the Docker part, and in DSpace General, or DSpace Dev to to the other stuff that that DSpace is doing, to the questions you have on, on in the tech channel and so on. So um, feedback is one thing that is really useful for us. <laughs> Any other business folks have while we're waiting for uh, this uh, REST API to start up? Yeah, the REST API will be the longest. <laughs> uh, I don't think I have any other updates to, to share right now, but I agree with what both of you have said in terms of jumping on Slack and, and getting involved. Most of our day-to-day -day discussions these days do happen on Slack. Uh, we still do use the developer mailing list on occasion, but if you want to get engaged with development going on and activities, definitely jump on Slack and there's channels for all sorts of topics there. All right, so here the REST, the REST API has started. Um, yeah. And let me just, I'll just um, load some items. So here we've, we've, we found our collection of items um, and uh, they're going to be the same <laughs> pictures of my dog, uh, probably, that are loading. Here, I've loaded the Angular UI on localhost 3000, and you'll see dog photos community. So that same content I had loaded into my DSpace 7. And let's uh, look at a picture of um... Anyway, so you can see we've got, uh, um, I guess I haven't built thumbnails over here, but we do have um, some images uh, loaded. So here now we're running uh, purely within Docker. We're running um, the DSpace 7 REST API, a compatible database, um, and the Angular UI all, um, you know, without installing any other software other than Docker on the desktop. 
Um, so if, you, if you've been curious to try out DSpace 7, but have been intimidated by installation requirements, uh, this would be a really useful path for you to try. All right, well, thank you so much for, uh, for joining and definitely eager to hear any feedback you all have on the tutorial. Thanks for joining us. And thank you very much, Terry. This has been very useful. Great, thanks, thanks. Terry. All right, y'all take care. Thank you, Terry. Bye.